Hi, this is Rick Warren, and you're watching Facets Television. I'm Mark Babbitt, CEO and founder of U-Turn, and you're watching Facets Television. Welcome back to AI Med here in Dana Point, California. You're watching Facets TV. And with us now is Jeremy Howard. He's the founder of, and deep learning researcher at Fast AI and the youngest faculty member at Singularity University. Thank you so much for coming in to talk with us today. I Hi. appreciate it very much. Okay. So I understand you've been a presenter um, here at the show. Sure. So you want to talk a little bit about what you were presenting on? Um, sure. I'm actually presenting four times, so four I'm, times. I'm keeping, okay. keeping busy. Um, as you mentioned in the intro, my focus is on something called deep learning. Mm -hmm. uh, deep learning refers to using uh, artificial neural networks to solve problems which previously couldn't be solved with computers. Mm -hmm. um, being able to do that in the medical setting, uh, we think, has the ability to bring medicine to the billions of people in the world who currently have no access. Mm -hmm. so, d so do you mean by that, by not having to have a clinician involved in cases where they may not be able to afford one? Is that what you're inferring? <clears throat> um, y you could talk about it as being not able to afford one, but it's kind of deeper than that. Okay. Um, according to the World Economic Forum, it will take 300 years to train enough physicians to meet the needs of the developing world. Mm -hmm. So regardless of how much money there is out there, there is not enough and will not be enough physicians to meet the world's needs. That's an interesting perspective I haven't heard yet. Okay. Yeah, so really the only option, therefore, is to create a lower bar where the computer can do more of the data interpretation and recommendations, mm -hmm. and we can teach humans to focus on the data gathering and the intervention part. Um, and so using that kind of approach, um, people in the remotest part of um, the developing world will have access to the same level or more of, of, of rigor and depth of diagnostic insight as somebody working with the top Mayo Clinic academics. Um, um, but the, the person they're dealing with will be their local community health worker. So that's interesting. So, I, it, so what you're saying is by, by developing this automation per se, but using the experience and the understanding of what we currently have, some natural learning and combined, all of a sudden people are gonna get the benefit of medical care they can't get currently. Um, kind of. Um, okay. The difference is that the way neural networks work is that they don't learn from the expertise and experience of humans. Mm -hmm. Because what humans do is we distill our learnings into little snippets and then we write it in books or write it in journal articles. Such snippets, must be highly compressed versions of the truth. The truth is always much more nuanced than that. And if you talk right. to a subspecialty expert in an area, they will be able to tell you about all the things that aren't in the books. The way machines can learn is from the raw data. So we can basically grab um, an entire archive of multiple hospitals worth of MRI scans and CT scans and electronic medical records and correlate it all together and basically have a, a computer algorithm which can, for every case, benefit from understanding the details of millions mm -hmm. of, of previous patients and uh, incorporate all that together to create a, a recommendation that is totally specific to the case that's being looked at. So one of the things that's been interesting to me is that sometimes there's a subtlety to the conversation and the, the body language of a patient, how they, how they present, right? that leads to a decision that maybe what they're telling you isn't quite accurate. <clears throat> it, how does a, an AI system adjust for the person who may be a Munchausen situation or something like that? I think that's a, it's an interesting question. And one of the opportunities actually is to avoid the problems with what you describe. Mm -hmm. Humans are much less good at interpreting that than we think. Mm -hmm. So 25 years ago, I did something very similar to what I'm doing now in healthcare, 
but for um, for lenders. Okay. So I was showing lenders how when they decide who to give a loan to, they could use a computer algorithm instead of having a, a room full of human loan auditors. Mm -hmm. And they had the same concerns, which was, you know, our human loan auditors know how to listen for that bit of the, you know, how somebody sounds or how they wrote yeah. something or the detail of how they express something. What we found was that um, they couldn't, not only could they not, but they were actually extremely biased. And what they were yeah. responding to was whether somebody's name sounded more African-American or Cultural whether it was a biases. woman or oh, whatever. That's interesting. And okay. so this is very much true in medicine right now. So in medicine, women are much less likely to be prescribed opioid medication for pain. Mm -hmm. um, um, African-Americans are much li less likely to be prescribed every single intervention with the single exception of amputation. Um, That's bizarre. It, it's not bizarre when you realize, when you, when you look at the implicit biases that we all have. Mm -hmm. So um, Harvard has this fantastic thing called the, uh, which is basically an implicit bias test that anybody can take. And once you've taken it, you realize we're all biased. Um, and but would so that be true? Let me ask, I don't mean to cut you off, but I mm. think I want to get to the depths of what you just said. Would that be true in a predominantly black community, even outside of the United States, you know, a predominantly black community with a black doctor, is that same bias implicit? Um, <coughs> every, every individual human's bias is different mm -hmm. and it depends on their particular conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, the point being that you're asking, you know, how a machine's going to leverage the unique strengths of humans. Um, my view is that these are actually deficiencies of humans and when you replace these gut feels mm -hmm. with, with real data and real analysis, um, in every other industry where that's happened, the results have been dramatically improved. Right. You know, an example we can all relate to is that back in the 90s, the way web search used to be done was by humans surfing the web um, Yahoo hired hundreds of surfers, they mm -hmm. called them, and they would then use their human judgment to decide which sites were interesting and how to categorize them and so forth. And then when Yahoo came along and replaced all that with a single algorithm called PageRank, yep. suddenly that got replaced with one text box you typed into, and now your results were personalized for you based right. on the full nuance and complexity of the entire World Wide Web. So we're really talking about replacing Yahoo with, with Google when we're talking about replacing an individual doctor's hunches with detailed analytics based on millions of patients. Mm -hmm. So how do we deal with, uh, from the point of the Google point, part of what they've found, um, and Facebook has had the same problem where things become more true based on the number of people that click on it rather than it's true truth, I guess right. would be the way to put it. So how do right. we deal with that issue? So this is all about what in the machine learning world we call labeling. So a label is um, kind of the ground truth of, you know, did this person live or die or, or whatever. <coughs> um, in medicine, the best kind of label is a true ground truth. In other words, what happened to this patient? Did they get better? Mm -hmm. Did they get worse? Did it cost lots of money? Did it cost a little bit of money? The, um, it's very challenging to get properly labeled data sets in medicine right now mm -hmm. because the radiology group and the pathology group and the lab tests group and so forth all have different data sets that are disintegrated. Right. Furthermore, every hospital has their own data set and multiple hospitals will see the same patient or multiple doctors. So actually being able to train something truly based on whether this patient got better or not is is challenging in right. this world where we have disintegrated data sets. And therefore, often the best we can do is to train where the ground truth is what the doctor thought. Um, and so, um, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, the, the solution is obvious, which mm -hmm. is to create the integrated data sets where we actually find out what happened to patients and they were training based not on a doctor's biased guess or report, but based on the actual medical outcomes of that patient. Um, that's only going to happen if we see some significant changes to the politics, culture, and regulation around medicine, at least so in the US. I was just about to ask the next question, which is interesting that you led to where exactly where I wanted to go, and that is, 
there is the minimum necessary discussion that goes along with HIPAA to start with. Then there is the sheer fear of sharing patient data from one organization that may not be clinically related to the other, but the idea is to get as much into the data lake as we can, right, so that you can do your analysis. What is it going to take to convince the politicking that this is more important than whatever subtle privacy issue may come out of it? Probably nothing. Okay. So my guess is this is not going to happen in America. Right. Um, I don't have much faith at all that America is going to be the jurisdiction in which the best advances in healthcare analytics are going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, in theory, the P in HIPAA stands for portability. Mm -hmm. HIPAA was meant to allow us to do this kind of sharing to so improve everybody's was, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. to improve everybody's health outcomes. Yep. Unfortunately, in the interest of trying to um, not be overly prescriptive, the authors of HIPAA left the entire thing one big grey area. So I deal with it every day. It's what I do. So right. I, I so fundamentally so then for a lawyer, gray clearly means black. Yeah. You know, so for a lawyer, unless they're told you can definitely do this and not get sued, then the answer is we're definitely not doing that. Period. Because we don't know. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think you'll see uh, in countries like China and India where the need is much greater. You know, they, they have hundreds of millions of people who have no other way of receiving health care other mm -hmm. than using this and who have perhaps, um, hopefully, will have been a bit more open to the kinds of data sharing that's necessary for healthcare analytics innovation. I think we'll see more, probably more progress there. Well, on that note, I really want to thank you for taking the time to come talk with us. Thank you. It's been enlightening. I appreciate it. Thank you. You've been watching Kevin McDonald and Facets TV at AI Med in Dana Point, California, and we hope you'll come back. And we're back at AI Med in Dana Point, California, and with us now is Dr. Kurt Kennedy, MD, PhD. He is the Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. Thank you so much for coming to talk with us today. Thanks for having me. Um, so why don't you give me a little bit of background on what you do for Baylor or at Baylor? Well, I'm a pediatric intensive care doc. I take care of kids that are on ventilators and require medicines to help their heart beat strong enough to give blood to the body. Uh, my, that's my clinical interest. My academic interest is really in this unit. Some of these kids have cardiac arrests. And if I look at a particular arrest and go back into the flow sheet before they had it, a lot of times I can see that it was coming. And, uh, the problem is, is these kids are throwing off thousands of data points every minute. And somehow they've got all of these nurses and staff around them that they managed to arrest. And, mm -hmm. and how is that? Mm -hmm. And... I'm sure that we prevent a lot of arrests, but some of them sneak through the borders. And my interest is in basically doing prediction models so that we can incorporate that trend of information leading up to it and, and put that into a model that can give caregivers at least a couple of minutes of time to prepare and potentially avoid those arrests. So I love that concept. I mean, to me, it, it, it sounds to me like it's sort of the natural match to AI, right? Which is the, we, we know certain patterns and in fact, as the doctor, you're going to tell the machine or the software, look for this pattern. But are we also not going to be looking for natural learning where AI learns itself what might be a pattern you don't see? Absolutely. I think that that's kind of the, uh, the promise of big data, right, is that there, there's things out there that I have no idea about right now. And we won't know about it until something discovers it. And, you know, we may be presented some signal and not appreciate that that's part of it until we actually sit and spend some time learning about it and realize it. We're going to have to recognize that that's part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that, you know, in this journey, I've done a lot of thinking on it, though. And to start off thinking that we're going to put everybody's exomes or genomes or microbiomes or all of this potential data that they've got available to them, that's what big data is. But when, when you start out, you really kind of need to fish where the fish are. So I, I so far have worked in vital signs and in the telemetry of the waveforms that these kids generate. So you're focusing on the, what, I, what I would call the near form results, right? You're, 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 the things that you know are close to a decision. Right. Um, 
are you do are you making that decision on your own or are you actually consulting with others that do what you do to say hey you know what would be a trigger for you is that part of a conversation that you have or so I, I would say that locally um, I, I work more alone than I do with a big group of people I know that there's some shops that are out there that have teams of people dedicated around questions like this mm -hmm. um, and really I, I would say that the most constructive feedback that I've had has been in conferences like AI Med where I get to meet not just a team that's in one institution or another, but people that are gathering from around the world mm -hmm. to come talk about these types of problems. And they bring, each of them brings a perspective that's different from my own. Mm -hmm. And they're able to explain it in a way that, you know, I won't leave the conference with their same level of understanding, but I start to see their perspective and I'll start yeah. to appreciate how that's going to fit into the grander scheme of things. Yeah, and if you change your viewpoint even slightly, it can, can per, you know, solve all kinds of problems, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, from your practice, from what you do each day, um, what's your vision for the future, what, uh, for the capability? Man, I... I don't think that I'm even able to envision it. I mean, if you'd asked me that question 20 years ago before the cell phone became what it is today, would you have That's predicted that we're going to be walking around, you know, bumping into yeah. each other on the elevators because we're not looking up from our screens as we're texting? Yeah, not a chance. I had a briefcase cell phone for my first one. I would have never imagined. <laughs> <laughs> so. but, but realistically, I, I, one of the things that I've loved about this particular conference is just kind of that vision of what does the future look like and, and my hope. My, my dream for the future is that these AI uh, techniques become so prevalent that they just become part of our in, innate knowledge and we're able to use the information and kind of leverage the utility out of it mm -hmm. without ever having to think about it. It's just going to be kind of part of the fabric of life. And, and if we can put that to good use and do things like save kids, then that's going to be a lot better than the other evil things that are going to be done with it, they're going to be just as prevalent. Yeah, we, I, I, I'm a cybersecurity person. That's what I do for a living. So yeah. the scary thing about AI is that it, that it has a tendency to learn things that you don't want it to learn as well, mm -hmm. um, or at least it enables people to learn things that you may not want them to. I think that's all worth it in the end, frankly. Um, so from the patient perspective, there's the whole conversation about privacy, and there was a little bit of a mention in a talk that I saw earlier about HIPAA, but in reality, there's the, the, the minimum necessary requirement, right? How do you get over the minimum necessary requirement without having to go into specific research? And what I mean by that is, how can we have EHR record systems from disparate medical systems talking to each other without violating that HIPAA sharing? I mean, is that something that you've thought a lot about and do you have any ideas on how we might be able to get around it? Um, I will say that that's not my forte. I, I have kind of purposefully ignored the whole HIPAA argument because I know that whatever I come up with, there's gonna be some kind of security measure that's gonna to need to be wrapped around it. Right. And that's somebody else's expertise, that's not mine. Okay. Um, so I, I've kind of stayed out of that, but I will say that the f philosophy behind HIPAA is a good philosophy. Some of the implementation details about it, I, I, you know, it, it's hard to, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, but they but, made it ambiguous and they also made it, um, in my opinion, they're interfering in many levels and that's my yeah. specialized expertise is HIPAA. Yeah. And I, I, frankly, it really does interfere in my I opinion. I think there's more interference than medicine. benefit from it. I would and, agree And with I think that, that if, at the end of the day, if you went and asked patients, you know, are you really, really paranoid about your data being out there, potentially used for good and bad, if the net's going to be good? I think most people would say, yeah, as long as the net's going to be good, let's do it. Yeah. And, yeah. and if everybody did it, then there's nothing to hide. Right. So, so if you could put something else in your toolbox, what would it be? <laughs> more people, more, more people. time, more energy. That seems to be a universal theme is people. Yeah. Um, is it because of... A, is it a budget issue? Is it a lack of the talent being available? Because I'm trying to help the, the folks out there understand what they need to do to support you folks and mm -hmm. what you're doing. So uh, again, kind of going back, I can only speak from my own experience, of but I, I have put years of work into this and, and the type of work I've had to do are things that I don't know anything about going into it. Mm -hmm. I'll start off on something, I'll trip, somebody will say, oh, you tripped over this and I've got to go back and relearn it and redo it. And uh, as time has gone on, it's been a very laborious process. I know a lot now compared to what I used to know. 
but in terms of time to patient, mm -hmm. what good can be done from this ultimately? If I had started out with a team of people that knew all the things that I needed them to know and I could just kind of direct them about where they need to be putting their talents and mm -hmm. resources to build this, mm -hmm. we could have had something that may have worked, you know, six or seven years ago. And if there's patients' lives at stake, there's lives that have been lost in the meantime because of lack of those resources. Yeah, that's, so, a, that's a really valid point. And I think also as we start to look at significant need for cost controls, that for me, if you can, if, adding in the fact that, of course, we're worried about a patient's life, right? But if you can reduce the number of cardiac recoveries that have to happen mm -hmm. as a result of stopping it from happening in the first place, absolutely. there's absolutely value there. And I just wish management would start thinking in front of it instead of behind it all the time. I, that's the feeling I get watching it from the outside because I'm, I'm not a medical yeah. professional, but I see it as someone who deals with it every day. Well, you know, I really appreciate that there's folks like you out there fighting the good fight for us and innovating in the world of medicine. And I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Well, I'd like to thank you for the offer. You bet. Thank, thank you. you. All right, you've been watching Facets Television. We're in Dana Point, California at AI Med, and we hope you'll come back. We're back at the AI Med conference, and with me is Dr. Steve Wortman. Dr. Wortman is an MD, PhD, and an MACP. He's got his AB from Cornell, his MD and PhD from Johns Hopkins. And he's one of our speakers here. He's also the president of the Association of Academic Health Centers. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Pleasure to be with you. Um, so you're one of the speakers. This is the first symposium of its type. Let's talk a little bit about first, what do you think of the event and what do you think the intent of this event is? Well, my view is one of excitement and enthusiasm. And the reason I say that, Kevin, is that getting the tech companies and the tech sector to work closely with the Academic Health Science Center is very important to me. And I see this as a first step toward major engagement in doing that. Mm -hmm. So there was some conversation yesterday about um, that there seems to be some people that perceive AI as a competition with doctors. I actually see it as an incredible enhancement and, a, and an, uh, an ability to produce more ideas and to increase your ability to do your job. How do you see uh, artificial intelligence? Well, I see it as necessary to the practice of medicine and increasingly so in the future. As knowledge moves more and more out of physicians' brains, which only have limited capacity to process the mega data sets for patients that are out there, we will have to work with artificial intelligence in all our medical decision making. I think the key challenge is how to do that best and how to do it in the interests of the patients so that care can be delivered compassionately. So what can the tech industry do best to, to remove the governor and take the limitations off of what you doctors would like to do with AI? I think first and foremost, the tech industry needs to demystify itself to the physicians and the academic community, mm -hmm. most of whom have not been trained in artificial intelligence, computer science, things of that sort. It's very hard for them to cross that line that says, yes, I'm comfortable with it. So I think the tech industry has to become more transparent and more clear about what it is they're doing, how they're doing it, and why it is not a threat, but a tremendous opportunity. I would agree that it is an immense opportunity. I, and the more I think about the, the releasing of information that's been trapped in paper records, and even in EHR records, right for doctors to be able to combine their own brains, right? And then use AI to, to pull that information out. Um, what do you think the biggest challenges are against AI at this point? Well, I think first of all, doctors have had a hard time in general with the electronic health record. Um, it's a platform that many will say have inhibited the doctor-patient relationship because it's taken time away from face-to-face -face contact with patients mm -hmm. and more with the computer. Yeah. To the extent that artificial intelligence can remove that barrier and restore the intimacy of the doctor-patient relationship, I think we'll have a good result. Well, that's fantastic. So um, what was your presentation about? I talked about what I think academic health centers need to do in this coming era of artificial intelligence. How they need, first of all, to optimally align their education, research, and patient care programs so that each teach each other to be better in real time mm -hmm. and thereby create a true learning health system. So as a technical person myself, I come from the technology industry. Right. So um, 
what can I do to best align in the way that you ask? I mean, how could I approach the medical community in a better way? I would say the seamless transmission of information between the spheres of research, patient care, and education are necessary to create platforms that work seamlessly together so that each improves the other in real time is the tech ta challenge in my view. Mm -hmm. So from the privacy perspective, there are some healthcare privacy regulations and I know that there's challenges especially with DNA sequencing, for right. example. How do you uh, anonymize a DNA sequence? You really can't, right? I think there are enormous ethical and moral challenges coming, not just in medicine, but in so many other fields with this revolution that's taking place and this transformation. I don't have the answers to it. I think reasonable people need to sit down and figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had in place, for example, HIPAA, which you're probably familiar with, mm -hmm. uh, for many, many years, and we've learned to work with that as best as we can. We've seen its flaws and we've seen its positives. Mm -hmm. I think the same approach is needed for this, but it's a little more complicated and I think a lot harder to come to a conclusion. So if you were king for a day and you could get anything you want to enable what you envision, what would that be? For healthcare? Yes. I would like to see um, artificially intelligent healthcare platforms that can be um, easily um, taken advantage of by patients anywhere in the world mm -hmm. at minimal cost with a superb uptake with the latest information, data, and treatment. That's what I would try to do. I would try to make healthcare uh, something that is available to everyone in a meaningful way. So the one last question, um, what do you think the biggest challenge is in getting the correlation of healthcare and AI in a proper way beyond the technology? Is it a, is it a social issue? Is it a, an education issue? What do you think yeah, that well, is? It's all of the above. It's a cultural issue. Okay. It's a cultural issue. You know, uh, organizations like medicine, institutions like medicine, academic centers, things of this sort, um, are conservative institutions. Mm -hmm. And those who work at these places are highly independent experts in what yeah. they do and getting them to change the way they do things is very, very difficult. I think the fundamental challenge is how do you bring about cultural and behavioral change to the field? So one thing that I recognize, and, and I'll make this our last point, is it seems that some see AI as a threat to what doctors are known mm -hmm. for. And how do we sort of alleviate that concern and convince them that, no, really, we're just going to enable you to, to truly be the best at what you can be? It gets back to what I said earlier, which is demystifying what AI is and how it can work. But we need to have, as a profession, a serious discussion about how are we going to work with and manage the machines. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, this isn't taking place yet. In a conference like this is a good start. What we're doing in our brand new Thought Leadership Institute is also another good start. We need to begin to discuss this issue in depth. How can the professions begin to deal with this issue? Uh, without that discussion, it will just randomly take place in an uncoordinated way, and I'm very concerned about that. Well, on that note, I really want to thank you so much for taking the time to come talk with us and to share your insights, and we're all excited and looking forward to what the world of AI brings to us. My pleasure, Kevin. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And we've been with Dr. Steve Wortman, and you're watching Facets Television.